Okay, hi. In this session, um, Alicia is going to show us the theory and some uh, tips for uh, the kind of photography you need to do for photogrammetry. Uh, go ahead. All right. Okay. So, yeah. So, I'll just start off with um, a definition on photogrammetry, some uses, and then uh, go through the first step of the workflow in photogrammetry. So, um, photogrammetry is sometimes also referred to as image-based modeling um, or structure from motion. And it's basically the process of taking overlapping 2D images to create a 3D point cloud. Um, so specific software detects common features within 2D images and uses them to reconstruct the movement of those points throughout the image sequence. And there are two types of photogrammetry, um, close range and aerial. And there are many industries that use photogrammetry, um, cultural heritage and archaeology being just one of them. And even within this field, there are various reasons for using it. Um, so as seen in the bottom left photo, um, a team of underwater archaeologists uh, recorded pottery lying on the seabed by um, 3D imaging them um, instead of using traditional recording methods such as um, drawing. Um, but it can also be used in other fields, um, such as forensic science. Um, it can be used to document crime scenes, as seen in the um, top photos, um, and to map out disasters, as seen in the lower right photo, um, which is, um, it shows a destruction of a building after an earthquake, so that responders um, could get an overview of the full damage. And so the standard workflow um, used in any photogrammetry software starts with image capturing. Um, so those images are uploaded into the software and they undergo alignment in order to build a dense point cloud. And from this point cloud, um, a mesh is rendered and then texture can be applied on top of it. So once the model is complete, um, you can export it in the file type of your choice and you can upload it online if you choose. And I believe that image capturing is um, one of the most important stages because it's manual and creating errors in the stage um, affects the rest of the workflow. So I'm gonna focus on this um, stage of the workflow for the rest of this video. So first thing you will need is to identify um, the equipment that you'll need based on the object that you're recording. So for any object, you will need a camera, a computer, and the software. And there's many types of photogrammetry softwares out there. Um, some are open access and some are licensed, but we're gonna be using um, Agisoft Metashape. So for small objects, you may choose to use a turntable um, to place the object on while you and the camera stay relatively stationary. Um, but it is optional since um, you can also keep the object stationary and then you can move around with the camera. Um, if you are moving around the object, just make sure that you have enough room um, to move 360 degrees. And so it's best to keep it on a small table or a stool. And if you wanna make the 3D model to scale and measurable, um, you'll need to add markers. And finally, if you are recording a large object um, such as a building or a landscape, you may want to use a drone to capture those photos. So as you select your object to 3D image, um, there are a few considerations to keep in mind. It's best to start off with a small object so you can um, easily capture all angles of it, um, since recording a building or structure will require reaching high and hard to reach spots. You may also choose um, an item that has a flat base um, so that the software can automatically fill the underside. However, there are many ways to capture the underside of an object, um, and we can discuss that later. Um, and there are materials that will not record so easily, such as shiny, reflective, or transparent objects. And this is a major concern, um, especially in cultural heritage, because people often want to 3D record um, shiny or glass objects. And one way that is suggested to combat this is to apply um, sort of a matte chalk coating onto the object. However, this is usually not allowed on artifacts um, 
because it can contaminate the archaeological residue on the object. Um, it's also not recommended to record objects with untextured surfaces um, because the software will have a hard time distinguishing different points on the object. So for example, if you were going to um, model a piece of fruit, you would want to pick a pineapple over an apple um, because the apple is more likely to have overlapping images that look too similar um, when you turn it, turn it 360 degrees. Um, also, apples tend to be shinier. So when you begin taking photos, um, it's best to do so systematically so that you know you're covering all areas of the object. And you can start by facing the camera directly in front of the object and circling it uh, from the same distance and angle until you arrive back at the starting point. You can then move your camera upwards while angling it down and circling it again 360 degrees and just repeating this process from different camera angles. Uh, one important note is that at, if at any point um, during shooting your object moves, you will need to start over uh, because the measurements taken from the photo will no longer be accurate. Um, so make sure that your object is on a stable surface and you do not knock it when taking photos. And if it's possible, and this is usually easier when you're shooting indoors, um, you can upload and align your photos in Adresoft before moving the object. That way, if you notice that um, you've missed an area while taking photos, so you can go back and take more um, without having to redo the entire process. So the Azure Soft webpage um, has recommended tips for image capturing. Uh, overlap is a very, uh, it's very important when taking photos and they suggest using um, 60 to 80% overlap meaning 60% of the object in one image should also be visible in the next image. And the number of photos you take will be varied um, depending on the object that you choose, but it is best to take more photos than you feel is required um, in case some don't turn out well or the software is unable to align them. You also need to consider um, lighting in the area. So make sure there are no visible light sources um, within the photo frames. And if you're outside, it's best to capture your images on a cloudy day so that there's no shadows on the object. And in terms of camera settings, uh, Agisoft also has recommendations for this. Uh, your camera should be of a high resolution of at least uh, five megapixels. And your phone camera um, may be good enough for this, but um, just make sure that your settings do not automatically readjust with, with each photo. And your focal length um, should be around 50 millimeters with a low ISO. And for aperture, a uh, f-stop value of uh, eight to 11 is recommended. And it may be tempting to create a shallow depth of field so that your um, background is blurred, but it's actually better for the software to pick up on the background of your object um, because then it has more data to work with. Um, so, it's also recommended if you are um, if you don't really have much of a background or if you're using a, um, a turntable with a white background or something like this, then you can um, try putting a newspaper um, on the turntable so that the camera picks, picks up more of a, um, a detailed background and it has more data to work with. And um, the last thing is make sure you're not using a slow shutter speed. Um, because that's more likely to cause blurred photos. And just some other best practices um, include deleting out of focus photos before uploading them into Agisoft. Um, make sure you're not changing your focal length while taking photos. Um, so don't zoom in and out um, because this can cause confusion for the software. Um, if you do want to focus on a detailed area, um, you can physically move the camera closer to it. Do not edit your photos before uploading um, because it's important that they have the same frame size and color. And if you're using a turntable, you may also want to use a tripod, uh, tripod to keep the camera steady and avoid blurry photos. So there's also some optional features when creating a 3D model, um, which can be important depending on the purpose for your model. 
uh, but keep in mind that they are available only on the professional version of Edusoft. So if you want to create accurate measurements on your model, um, you will place coded markers. Um, and they can be printed from the Edusoft website, and you can see them here on the um, left photo. Uh, you place uh, at least two markers and measure the distance between them. And it's best to place them beside the object, not on them, so that you can delete them later from the final model. And once you import your images to Edusoft, there's an option to flag the markers and input the measurement between them, giving you a scaled object. And georeferencing is another measurement tool um, that's usually used in aerial photogrammetry. And you would use at least 10 markers um, across the landscape and take GPS points of where these markers are. And um, these are known as ground control points. So yeah, those are the basic steps of um, photogrammetry and basic first steps. So I will hand it back to Gabby. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, that's um, that's a really good uh, basic outline. I mean, there's there's a few um, things. Uh, the and aerial photography and landscape photography used to be used to be done. I mean, drones, as you say, are the most common way to do it now. People used to do them um, either with light aircraft or even balloons. Um, yeah. Now, people still do. I think do you know balloon photography, where you know the, the camera's on a small balloon that's that's raised up, and and they can move that around and therefore take take photograph and. You know, mm -hmm. getting, getting photogrammetry of a landscape actually, you know, does give, um, uh, you know, a much more um, a granular sort of texture of that landscape that helps help people to, to to find things like you know archaeological sites and and you know possible um, hill forts and things like that through uh, through uh, through through the the you know analysis of those models. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's a very exciting. Um, use of it but but yes obviously that's not something we can we can practice this week but um, mm -hmm. but yes just just walking in a circle around an object with a with a cell phone camera is um is already going to get you know pretty pretty cool results great and we will see more we'll see more of that in future videos great <laughs>